Now here are the laws of wealth from three excellent sources. First is the Bible. Second is John Kennedy. Third is Zig Ziglar. That's, that's good company. I'm happy Zig's here today. You're going to enjoy. The wealth formula. Okay. First, I've already quoted from the Bible. He that wishes to be the greatest, find a way to serve the many. So that's the first key to the wealth formula. Service to many, finding a way. Now, some may have a wish to serve many, but you need a way. So you keep searching till you find a way, because if you search, you will find a way to serve more and more so that your life will be greater and greater. The second, John Kenny's inaugural speech. Here's what he said. Don't ask. Don't we wish that was the current political philosophy? Where is John Kennedy? John Kennedy said, don't ask what the country can do for you. No matter how poor you are. Don't ask. That's not how you get trophies to put on the mantle above the fireplace. That's not how you become wealthy and rich. That's not how you have abundance. Don't ask what the people can do for you. But, he said, ask, what could I do for my country? What could I do for my neighbor? What could I do for the people in my community? How could I serve more than myself? Ask what you could do for your country. And some people have found out a way to serve the whole country. Some find a way to serve a limited piece of the country. Some find a way to serve a few right around their neighborhood. Some find a way to serve working on a job, rendering a service. But that's the key. Don't ask what they can do for you. Ask, what could I do for them? Why? Asking, what could I do? And beginning the process starts wealth moving in your direction. Key phrase, whatever you move toward tends to move towards you. If you move toward intelligent, it seems now to move towards you. God says, you move toward me and... I will move toward you. You take human steps, I take God's steps, I get there very quickly. Whatever you move toward, if you, tend to, if you move toward success, success seems to start coming your way. So figure out what you could do to make the move, to begin the early qualifications and then sustain the qualifications and success is yours and health is yours and all valuable things are yours. Now, the third, of course, is Zig Ziglar, and I'm going to borrow. Hopefully, he wasn't going to use it today, so I get to borrow it. Zig's got the best formula put in layman's terms I've ever heard. If you help enough people get what they want, you can have everything you want. Help enough people get what they want, you can have everything you want. When I first heard that, I underlined the word everything. And guess what I did? I went for it. If you help enough people get what they want, you can have everything you want. Here's another way to put it. If you help enough people get what they need, you can have everything you need. So you don't supply your need by concentrating on your need. You supply your need by concentrating on the answer, by the deserving, helping enough people. This weekend is another part of my life, sharing, helping, translating my experiences by the best language I can choose, as awkward as it sometimes seems. Words are clumsy sometimes when you try to express what's going on in your head, let alone your heart. But I'm going to struggle best I can these days with the English language, trying to make it valuable to all of you. Okay. Now, start a little subject called personal development. As you know my story, I met someone when I was 25 years old, his name was Earl Schof, who dropped into my life at an extraordinary time. So key phrase, timing has a lot to do with it, and who knows part of the mystery of time, the timing. Part of the timing one I, I was I just had that experience that I've shared in other seminars when the Girl Scout knocked on my door. 
And I walked to the door and she gave me the big pitch on the Girl Scout cookies, best organization in the world for girls. Got several flavors, time to buy the cookies, only two dollars. And with a big smile, she very politely asked me to buy. No problem, I wanted to buy. Big problem, I didn't have two dollars in my pocket. And I didn't want to tell her that. So I did what I thought was next best, I lied to her. And I said, hey look, I've already bought plenty of Girl Scout cookies, we've still got plenty in the house we haven't eaten yet. She said, oh that's wonderful, thank you very much, and she leaves. When she leaves, I say to myself, I don't want to live like this anymore. I mean, how low can you get lying to a Girl Scout? I mean, that's, <laughs> that's low down. I told myself that day, this will never happen to me again. One of those experiences. It's, it's called like life changing. I said, I'm going to search till I find better opportunities so my pocket won't be empty and the bank account won't be empty and I won't be so far behind on my promises to my family. And it was shortly after that, I meet Earl Schoff, who taught me how to be wealthy, who taught me how to change my life. So who knows what the connection is, right? Someone says when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. You know, I don't know all the mystery of that. But anyway, it seems like uh, some of those things uniquely happen. But it was Mr. Schof over a five-year period before he died at age 49 who taught me some extraordinarily simple things. He only went to the ninth grade in school, never finished high school, never went to college, never went to university. So he put his ideas and his experiences in very simple language, which I think for me, you know, a kid from the farms of Idaho, uh, that simplicity was so important. Because if it would have been technical, I'd have missed it. If it would have been mystic, I, you know, I would have you know, backed away. But it was just basic, blunt, ABC, familiar stuff that I hadn't thought of before. And he did start to remind me, and those ideas changed my life. Mr. Schof was the one when I said, you know, this is all they pay. He said, you've been working six years, Mr. Owen. How come you're not doing better? And I said, this is all the company pays. He says, well, that's not true. I said, no, this is my paycheck. This is all the company pays. He said, no, this is all the company pays you. I thought, <laughs> that's a new way to look at it, right? He said, doesn't the company pay two, three, four, five times this amount to other people? And I said, well, yes. He said, well, then this is not all the company pays. It's all they pay you. And if you qualified, wouldn't your income grow two, three, four, five times? I said, I suppose. So he said, we don't have to work on the company. We have to work on you. See, that was the beginning of what he called the phrase personal development. I told him things cost too much. He said, no, you can't afford them. I thought, well, that's a new concept. I, I hadn't thought about that. You know, we put some of the valuable things on the high shelf, so you can't get to them until you qualify. If you want the things on the higher shelf, you've got to stand on the books you read. Every book you read, you get to stand a little higher so you can get the things on the higher shelf. See, I learned those concepts. It was so incredible. And here was the most important one. Success is something you attract by the person you become. See, that phrase changed my life. Success is something you attract by the person you become. Success is not something you pursue. It's like chasing a butterfly, you can't quite catch it. Success is something you attract by becoming an attractive person. See, those were new concepts to me. I'm just working hard trying to make a living. Here's what he said to me, this changed my life. I got a chance to teach this in Moscow and across Russia, three visits, now the fourth. Here's what Shof taught me, profits are better than wages. Nobody taught me that in high school. Nobody taught me that. I went to one year of college. Nobody taught me. Profits are better than wages. Wages make you a living. Profits make you a fortune. And how could you work on both a living and a fortune? He said, well, you could start part-time working on your fortune while you're working full-time on your living. I thought, wow. Now he said, it's fun to get up in the morning. Not just getting up, go to work to pay the rent. 
but to get up to go to work to make a fortune. First to make a living for my family, second to make a fortune. And he taught me how to make both a living and a fortune. Guess what I did? I learned how to make both a living and a fortune. And I found out anybody could do it once they get the information. And at age 25, I started receiving this extraordinary information. Here's what he said, your income is directly related to your philosophy, not to the economy. I thought no one ever told me that. I kept hoping the economy would change. He said, no, your philosophy has to change. I assured him that I had my fingers crossed. He said, that won't help. Then what could I do to change my income and multiply it by two, by three, by five, by ten, and then multiply it by ten again? What could I do? And he started giving me the disciplines and the process of learning the skills to change my life. This was an extraordinary man. Those were extraordinary times for me. Life changing in every manner that you can imagine. But very simple ABC concepts. Here's what I learned. Not to search for the exotic until you've discovered the basic. And those basic philosophies that he shared with me during that time were life-changing and he called it personal development now in the understanding of personal development let's go through it quickly some notes before we take our first break if you're okay say I'm okay how many of you have one page of notes already one page good okay jot these ideas down first for personal development we must understand the law of the seasons and the lesson of the seasons which prompted that first book the first book of mine seasons of life here's the phrase life and business is like the changing seasons Frank Sinatra used to sing life is like the seasons Next phrase, you cannot change the seasons, but you can change yourself. The seasons are set. As soon as we arrive on this spinning planet headed somewhere, that's the question to ask. What is the setup? First, so I can survive. Second, so I can succeed. So one of the first things to do is to learn the rhythm of the seasons. The rhythm of night and day. Day follows night. Night follows day. Opportunity follows difficulty. Difficulty follows opportunity. Recession follows expansion. Regularly. Expansion follows recession. Sadness follows joy. Joy follows sadness. It's called the rhythm of life. So in the seasons now, make these notes. First, learn to handle the winters. Hopefully each winter we get stronger by the process of the experience of the past winters, learning the lessons of the past to apply to the present. In the winter you have to hang on, in the winter you have to endure. That's part of the rhythm of life. And there's all kinds of winters physical winters and personal winters and political winters communism cast a long shadow on one third of the world in that long winter of despotism about 75 80 years it lasted political winters social winters spiritual winters personal winters when things don't work well Barbara Streisand sings it used to be so natural to talk about forever but used to bees don't count anymore they just lay on the floor till we sweep them away you don't sing me love songs you don't say you need me and you don't bring me flowers anymore a song of winter but we're all acquainted with those experiences but here's the key you must just hang on in the winter make the note it doesn't last forever some winters seem longer than others some winters seem tougher than others some winters are more critical and crucial than others. But here's the note, they will pass. The night can only be a few hours. As far as we know, there's never been a double night. 
And the whole key to this is, surely you can make it just a few hours. Hang on. Whether it's playing a game or whether it's an enterprise, the winters do come. Mickey Mantle, my hero back in those days of the Yankees. Wow. He used to get in the batting slump. It was tragic to watch. This is the home run king. This is the fastest man in baseball. This is one of the most accomplished players ever to play the game. But he used to have these terrible slumps when it seemed like he couldn't get a hit or he couldn't get very many and he couldn't hit home runs. And someone asked him one time, what do you start changing? He said, I don't change anything. He said, what do you do? He said, I wait till it's over, right? You just keep swinging and you just keep hanging in there until finally it passes. Maybe you need a little touch of refinement, but for the most part, here's what you have to do. Endure, because the winter finally passes and the night finally fades away and the daylight comes and the shadows flee away. So the winters we just have to handle. Here's what's next, the spring. Spring always comes, opportunity follows difficulty, day follows night. Here's what spring is called, opportunity. Spring is not a guarantee, it's guaranteed to come, but it's not spring that guarantees the harvest. Here's what you must do, use the spring to your best advantage. And you've got to hurry because spring is usually not very long. The short season of spring reminds us of urgency. If you want a full harvest, come harvest time, you've got to take advantage, but you must do it quickly. Spring is the opportunity to meet someone. Sometimes you have to do it quickly. Here's a person you say, be nice to meet that person, but before you get a chance to say hello, they're gone. In space language, we call it window of opportunity. If the rocket doesn't launch and if the spacecraft doesn't go in an appointed time, it's got to wait for another cycle of times. If you don't get it planted this spring, you've got to wait for another cycle of seasons before you have another chance. So, the urgency of spring. Life is brief, so take advantage of every spring you can get for your lifetime. The Beatles wrote, life is very short. And for John Lennon, it was extra short. For Michael Landon, it was extra short. For my dear business colleague, Mark Hughes, it was extra short. He died at age 44. So, it's brief. Bill Bailey reminded me, it's easy to say I've got 20 more years. But here, that, that sometimes fakes you out, saying I've got 20 more years, meaning it looks like you've got a lot of time. But here's what he said, if you go fishing once a year, you've only got 20 more times to go fishing. Not 20 years to go fishing, 20 times. So you've got to make each time count when the opportunity comes, each time. So take into account the brevity of life. My father lived to be 93, but it seemed so short. I kept asking for another 10 years, another 10 years, and finally, you know, it ran out. But 93 is not bad, but it still seems short. So it is short. So pick up the urgency of spring now. Knock on every door to find the opportunity. Search and search till you find answers for your future. And do it quickly, because spring is short. What if you asked a farmer to go bowling in the spring? He would say, insanity. You can go bowling in the winter, but you can't go bowling in the spring. Good note to make. What to do in springtime. 